What do we see when we look around? January, Paris. February, Copenhagen. Garland, Texas. Go farther afield. Go to Afghanistan, where Al-Qaeda was based and from which the 9-11 plot originated. In Afghanistan, about 4,000 Taliban were captured and interrogated, and seriously interrogated, and other stuff. The pattern that came out from the interrogations was, even though they were dying in droves on a battlefield, they were convinced that they were going to take over Afghanistan, retake it. And that, was, that came out about three years ago. That was a NATO study made public. Today, the, the Taliban have about half of Afghanistan under their control, which is an area roughly the size of Oregon. And that, this, the borderlands shift, but that's a sizable amount of territory. And of course, the largest gain in territory is owed to the Islamic State, or ISIL, or you can think of your own more fitting acronyms for them. Now, the Islamic State controls something like the, the size of the United Kingdom in parts of Syria and Iraq. And that is significant in itself, and they're, they're a brand of barbarism that we haven't seen in a long time in the world. But here's a, a more significant aspect that I want to share with you the number of foreign fighters that they have attracted is significant. The absolute number, best estimates I've seen, is around 20,000, which doesn't sound like a lot. That's, I mean, if you went to the US military, 20,000 troops would not be a big part of our military. What's significant is that people are joining. They're coming across the oceans, across land, from all corners of the Earth. And what makes this even more surprising, or, or at least puzzling and weird and crazy is that there is no secret what Islamic State is about. It's not as if they're duping people into doing this. They are really good at promoting what they do on YouTube, on the web, on Twitter. They're very open about their goals, and yet people are flocking there. If you remember in the 1980s, the war in Afghanistan drew a lot of foreign fighters. This is where uh, Osama bin Laden and some of his lieutenants teamed up and originated the idea for Al-Qaeda. They were fighting the Soviets, and this was seen as a battlefront for the, the jihadist movement. That battle, that war in Afghanistan, drew many, many foreign fighters. But ISIS is drawing many more than that. So if that was a watershed in animating and encouraging the Islamist movement and giving them some fuel and confidence, what ISIS is doing is doubly so. Finally, if you look around, who's casting the largest shadow in the Middle East today? It's not ISIS. ISIS is a big deal and it's a terrible phenomenon. It has to be dealt with. But it's not nearly the largest, most influential movement or group. It's Iran. Iran, as you probably, if you read the headlines in the last few days, there's a negotiation over its nuclear program. It is going to acquire nuclear technology at some point. It already has incredible influence over the capitals of Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen. And of course, Iran is a major funder of the Assad regime in Syria. So Iran has incredible influence across the region. And it is, it sees itself, and in many ways it is, an embodiment of the Islamist movement. So if you look around, what you see is a movement that is, it's, it has material strength, not a considerable amount of material strength, but it's significant. It's captured territory. But more significant than all of those material gains and measures of its strength, is the moral strength, in the sense of having the morale, the confidence, 
the ambition and the belief that they can win. That is incredibly important in understanding the jihadist movement, and it is one of the points I want to emphasize today and help you understand, because this is the crux. It is what draws people in and what keeps the movement going, the belief that they can succeed. So, I've painted a dire picture, bleak. What happens when we think about it? What do we tell ourselves? What do we tell ourselves? Well, we tell ourselves lots of stories, and not very pleasant ones. So, uh, in my book, if you've read it, Winning the Unwinnable War, I talk about the ways in which American policymakers have been dancing around the necessary step of figuring out who is this movement, what is it about. And that hasn't stopped. So, if you remember, after 9-11, there was a lot of uh, prevarication and weaseling around, well, they're hijackers of a great religion, or they're terrorists, and that one has stuck. People think of them as terrorists. Well, so was Dylan Roof in a certain way, right? The shooter in Charleston. So that doesn't really help you identify what's going on. More recently, that dance around what is it we're facing has become something fitting for the Onion, the newspaper, the Onion, the satirical newspaper, the Onion, because I, I read these every day and I think, the Onion couldn't top this. This is just, I mean, how do you get, how do you get there? I mean, the people at the Onion are probably smacking their heads every morning thinking, ah, oh, they took that one. I had that one ready for Thursday. <laughs> and, I mean, let me, let me substantiate that a little. So. Right now, the last, so there was a moment, and this, ha, this caused a flurry of criticism, but for a moment there was an attempt to describe large-scale attacks like 9-11 and the, like the kinds that have been foiled by various intelligence services as not terrorist attacks, not even acts of war, which I, I think would be a better term, but man-caused disasters. Now, yeah, that didn't stick, and for good reason it didn't stick, but notice what's happening there. The whole phenomenon is emptied of meaning, because a man calls disaster could be, you know, you're Homer Simpson and you're sitting at the nuclear plant, and you fall asleep, you press the wrong button, and the thing melts down. That's a man caused disaster too, right? Flying a jet into the World Trade Center, that's not a man caused disaster. That is an act of war. Now, the idea of bleaching out the meaning of these acts and the movement itself is now fully expressed in the, the, the way the Obama administration wants us to view them. And this, I, I think, this is why I think The Onion is, you can't top this. So, the Obama administration convened a summit on combating, wait for it, violent extremism. The hell is that? And that wasn't just my reaction. Some of the people, some of the delegates, so the establishment type delegates who showed up said, well, look, <laughs> we agree there's all kinds of violent people in the world, and we agree there's all kinds of extremists, but frankly, the only kind that we're talking about at this summit <laughs> are the ones waging jihad. So maybe this is going too far, this whole idea of talking about violent extremism. And yet, violent extremism, that is the way we're supposed to think about it. Now, that is, it is a corruption of thinking. It does not give you any clarity, and it's purposeful. I mean, so these descriptions that I've been giving you, the terrorism, hijackers of a great religion, all of these attempts to conceptualize the movement, now, these are from the people who are the intellectual political leaders, their, their responsibility is to get this right. This isn't just your friend at work who's got some muddled ideas and who's not looking into this seriously. This is people who should be. And they're polluting the discussion, they're polluting our understanding, and that has serious consequences. And, and let me just emphasize, 
My complaint is not a semantic one. It's not about word choice. You don't solve this by pulling out a dictionary or thesaurus and wordsmithing something better. There are different terms you could use. What's important is the underlying conceptual, the conceptualization, the thought behind the word. And on that, we just don't have any clarity. And there's purposeful attempts to obfuscate and make it unclear. Now, I mentioned my book. In my book, one of the things I argue is that not having this clarity about the movement has crippled our policy response to 9-11. And it's still doing that in different ways. Another consequence, which I want to emphasize today, is this. Because there is no clarity, because there's a, a various attempts to make this harder to understand, that affects the public discussion, and it, I think, disarms Americans. It, it, it makes it harder for them to advocate for better policies, better solutions. So my goal today is twofold. I want to offer you greater clarity on what this movement is about, what it seeks, what animates it, what, what it is that attracts people to it. And then I want to walk through a couple of counterpoints, counter-arguments or counter-explanations that you might have heard or that you might encounter and that reasonable people buy into. So I'm, I, there are definitely views that you could raise that I think are fringe or beyond the pale, and if you're interested, you can ask about some of them in the Q&A. I'm not interested in those. I don't think those are the kind of views that have to be defeated. And the value of going through these counter-arguments is some of them you might find plausible, and I'm going to make them as plausible as I can. Even if you personally don't find them plausible, if you want clarity, you need to be able to disentangle them, to figure out what's, what element of truth makes this plausible to people, and what's my answer to it. And if you're going to be an articulate, effective advocate for your own ideas, you need that clarity. And this is good. my hope is that this will help you sharpen your skills, your analytical skills, and sharpen your ability to reach other people who don't already agree with you. I meet lots of people who come to me and listen to my talks, and they love it, and they, they agree with me, and they, they, they're excited to hear it, which is great. And then they go talk to people that agree with them. And they talk to the people that agree with them, and there's this sort of bubble that is created where, what about reaching the people who are uncommitted or are still open to changing them or have no view and need a better view? It's really important to figure out how to reach people who don't already agree with you to reach other minds. And to do that, it's important to see what is the views they've heard, what are the views they've heard, how to get through to them, how to remove wrong views and, and direct them in the, in the direction of the truth. So the goal is to give you that kind of clarity and confidence in your own knowledge so that you can become better at advancing your own goals and your own values. And, I, and I'm not suggesting there's a duty to go out and advocate for this, but I think it's important enough that you would want to, and I hope you do. So with that in mind, I want to walk through two points. What is this movement? And then what are some of the other explanations that are offered for it? And the overall point that I want to illustrate in doing this is that to understand it, to understand the Islamist movement or jihadist movement, and I'm going to use those interchangeably today, you need to recognize the fundamental goal that shapes it, the ideas that move it. And when you get that, when that becomes clear to you, the counter explanations, are, you can understand what makes people buy into them, and you can explain what's wrong about certain elements of them and what's right about certain elements. You, it enables you to reach other people and it will give you greater clarity. So this is a movement that's fundamentally shaped by its religious goal. I want to show you how that works. For some of you, this might be a refresher. If you've heard me speak or you've read about the subject, and I think that's a good thing to have, a refresher. If this is new to you, great. So, if you've heard anything about the Islamist movement and its history, you will doubtless have heard about this man, Said Qut, Q-U-T-B, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it. He lived from 1906 to 1966, 
and he died on the noose in an Egyptian prison. He was not the founder of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, but he was their preeminent intellectual leader. And his view, which I'll illustrate in a moment, is it captures the essence of what this cause is about. So he was looking around the world, and everywhere he looked, the basic conclusion was life sucks. Well, he didn't quite put it like that, but in his view, the world was going to pot. What's, what's wrong? Well, we Muslims are inferior to the rest of the world. Look at us. We're seized of the truth of Allah's word, and yet, look, we're poor, we're destitute, we don't have the power that we once did under Muhammad. All of that is a failing. Now, there's an important assumption here that I want to highlight, which is that the correct state of affairs, the right state of the just state of affairs, is for Islam to dominate, to be supreme, and for Allah's word to dominate and to be in the minds of all men and on the lips of all of them. So this idea of having supremacy is important. Now, that's the state of the world, so that's the problem. And what's the cause of this? What's the, why is this the case? Well, everywhere you look, he says, there is unbelief. We've fallen from the true path. If you look at the books, if you look at the movies, if you look at radio, music on the radio, if you look at the way people behave and the, what they wear, everywhere you look, there is unbelief. We are assaulted in all directions from by this idea of secular law, by the idea that men can rule men, that society could have, that you could live in a world without obedience to God and godly ways. So we're impious, and that is the source of our weakness. Well, what, what do you do about that? What's the remedy here? Well, quite obviously, you need to return to the true path, and Islam is the solution. You need to go back and embrace piety. And the fundamental here, and what makes this a political, ideological movement, isn't just you need to have a different way of life individually. It's that society needs to be shaped from top to bottom by a complete imposition of religious Islamic law. And how do you get that? Do you just preach? Well, preaching is important. You definitely need to do that. And the Muslim Brotherhood in its, in its early days and still believes in cultivating a society and a culture of Islam so that it's in the, the marrow of each person that this is the way the truth leads. But you can't stop with preaching. That's not enough. What about the people who are Stubborn, what about the people who can't be reached? What about the people who won't listen to you? And for that, there's a ready solution. We all know what that is, he says. You need to use force. You need to wage a war to do this. And the principal uh, theme or the, what he evokes here, the, the kind of button that he presses is jihad. We have to wage a war. We have to struggle and strive in the path of God. And by doing this, we each individually gain self-worth. This is an important point. I'll come back to it again and again. That in doing this, th so if you live a debauched secular life, you didn't know it, but you are. Every thought you're having is an ungodly thought. And you're going to have all kinds of problems psychologically in, in, in your own life. That's what he claimed. And if you want to avoid that, you need to embrace the path of jihad. And that will give you self-worth. That, that will make you a good person. Because striving for a just world is good. And no sacrifice is too great. This is crucial. You must give of everything you have. So this is what you get. You get, we have a problem. You no, 
The problem is we're, we don't believe in Allah enough. And it's worse than that you don't believe. It's worse than that. It's, you have to feel ashamed of the fact that you're, you're behaving as if the Quran were never written. It's as if you were given the truth and you scrunched it up and you threw it in the trash. Shame on you. So you have given up on the truth. That has caused you to be miserable and weak and, and falling from your proper station in the world. And so to correct that, you need to fight. Now, that's the what and the why and the how of the movement. And I stressed just a moment ago that it's important to see that there's a personal dimension to this, which is that in striving for this religious idea of holy war in a society shaped in totality, you gain value individually. What does that society really look like? Well, it means submission. It means you bow to authority. It means tyranny, right? It means every aspect of your life is dictated to you by people who claim to speak in the name of Allah. So it's a totalitarian system in the model that you might recognize under the Soviets. And its scope has to be not just your life, but all human life. Because if, if, if Allah's word is true, it's true in all places and all times for all people, there are no exceptions to that, and there can be no exceptions politically, neither in your life nor in society, nor globally. In logic, just, you can't limit it. If you limit it, you're suggesting that there are areas in life for, in which faith has no role. And that's blasphemy. I mean, that's, talk about le turning your back on Islam. And so there's this world community of Muslims. They, they have to see themselves as a brotherhood, all aligned in the name of realizing Allah's dream. World ruled by that doctrine. So this is a movement that believes in controlling people, denying freedom, denying thought, denying the idea of a society where you get to live and prosper. There's no place for that. Now, you might ask, or you might hear people ask, but is it really a movement? Is it really a global movement? It's a good question. Because there are so many ways in which each of the constituent groups and intellectuals who lead it, they're different. There are lots of differences, and I'm going to give you a few of those. The favorite way of putting this is it's not monolithic. You, know, you guys know what a monolith, right? You know what that is? It's a big stone kind of obelisk thing. I'm coming to the view that only monoliths are really monolithic, because you hear this everywhere. <laughs> Nothing is monolithic. Well. I think there's, there's a wrong way of conceptualizing the issue, but let's, let's take this argument and see what it comes down to. So the idea that it's not monolithic is, okay, so you talked to me about Said Qut. He was an Egyptian. He spoke in Arabic. Okay, well, Ayatollah Khomeini, who came to power in Iran, was a Persian who spoke Persian, and he was a Shiite on top of it, which is different from the Muslim Brotherhood. That's true. And then if you go to Pakistan, there was a major intellectual called Abul al-Madudi who wrote in Urdu. And he was Pakistani. All right, that's all true. So what? What unites them? That's the question. But there are further differences. And here's where the idea that it's not monolithic comes into, comes into play and becomes a really powerful case that people think it has to be taken seriously. And it does have to be taken seriously, but not in the way that they would like you to think. Look at all the disagreements among them. And there are disagreements, many and serious ones. Let me give you some examples. One of the biggest disagreements is, who do we go after first? Right? So there's the targeting of the enemy. So there, there was a, a period in the beginnings of this movement's ascent when the emphasis was on the so-called near enemy. And by that I mean, if you were in Egypt and you're in the Muslim Brotherhood, the near enemy was 
the military dictatorship that was keeping you down and preventing you from overthrowing them and forming a new Sharia regime. That's the near enemy, the local leader, the nearest target. And then you get groups saying, mm, that's not quite right. The, the real priority here is the far enemy, the West itself, the source of secular ideas, the source of separating man from religion. The, the driving wedge between Muslims and their faith is the West, so we have to go after them. And this is, Al-Qaeda was, one of its distinguishing features was the emphasis on the far enemy. And the more you read into the subject, the more you get, well, there's the near enemy and the far enemy, and they disagree, and there's really strong fights over this. It's true. There are lots of fights over this. And then there are groups or, or regimes or, like Iran. Iran has no problem. It's, we'll, we'll go after both. <laughs> we'll start a revolution in Iran, then we'll export it. And then groups like Hamas, which is, this is the, the best case you can find for this argument. So Hamas is just interested in the Palestinian conflict. It's a classic near enemy kind of, no it's not. If you read the Hamas charter, what they're interested in is, we'll take over all of Palestine, meaning we'll destroy Israel. And then we'll keep going because we're the vanguard of the jihadist movement and we'll lead you to the rest of the way to a global scale. And when you find groups that emphasize the so-called near enemy, there's one, there was a group in Upper Egypt, we call the jihadist group of Upper Egypt, and they published a pamphlet and they listed their priority targets and their, their agenda. Number one, we have to get the military dictatorship out of the way. Then we'll go after the Muslims who've turned their back on Islam, the apostates. And then we'll go after the people who need to be converted. And then, number four, we'll go after the West. Okay, so what this boils down to is a disagreement over strategic priorities among people who agree that either now or later, you have to dominate the world. As grandiose and weird as that sounds, that's basically what they're arguing for. So there's real disagreement, but it's disagreement within at a certain framework of agreement about what needs to happen. And then you can multiply this idea that, well, there's disagreement and they fight. They do fight viciously among themselves. The infighting among the groups and the splintering among the groups is it's dizzying. There's a website put up by scholars at Stanford, and it maps graphically how the Islamist groups originated and then how they split and what alliances there are, and when, when the alliances break and they have a timeline and you can zoom in and zoom out. You should go look at this thing. <laughs> the more you look at it, the more you realize there's a lot of infighting. I mean, some large-scale examples. <clears throat> Iran is fighting against ISIS in the battlefield. They're killing each other. Even though, when you step away from that, what Iran is trying to do and what ISIS is trying to do, you can't really distinguish between the two. Not in fundamental respects. Another case of infighting is the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a very famous sort of originator of this movement intellectually in Egypt, and then one of the two principles of Al-Qaeda, if you remember, he's number one now because bin Laden's been killed, thankfully, but he was number two for a long time, Ayman al-Zawiri. And he was one of the uh, founders of Al-Qaeda. Now, he, in his biography, he spends a whole chapter denouncing the Muslim Brotherhood, which incidentally had inspired him in part to become a jihadist. No, he, he thinks they're the gradualists. I and mean, he, he would go to the point of killing them if he had the chance and opportunity. But his view is they're sellouts, they're gradualists, and more than that, they would contemplate using other means than violence to get into power, such as elections. And guess what? They actually did that, and it worked. So there is infighting. There is disagreement. But what's significant is what those disagreements are and where they agree. And what unites them, despite all of these points of contrast, is that at the end of the day, they all want the same thing. They want to rule people. They want to subjugate people. And they will use force to do it, avidly. 
and they will give their lives to do this willingly. And if you were asking, is it really a movement? Given all this disagreement and they can't agree on tactical issues and they're fighting and they're killing each other on the battlefield, yeah, that is part of what a movement looks like when it's seeking political power. If you want a historical parallel here, think of other movements that have been around. Now, the socialist movement, the communist movement, there were socialists in England called the Fabians. I don't know if, has anyone heard them by a show of hands? Yeah. So the Fabians, their idea was the way we're going to convert England, so the near enemy, if you want the analogy, the way we're going to convert England into a socialist world is we're going to work our way through gradually through using trade unions educating the workers step by step and eventually we'll win over the minds of everyone and that will reshape society. Okay? And then you, uh, other groups on the same axis will tell you gradualism? Revolution now. Everywhere. Overthrow the capitalist system wherever you can. Education? Well, obviously we need to, everyone to buy into the Marxist ideas, but Pick up your arms, comrades. Time for revolution. And you can apply the same argument. It was not monolithic. No, not in that sense. They disagreed on tactics and strategy and priorities, and some of them worked in continental Europe, some of them were in England, some of them were in China. And those differences in certain contexts matter if you're studying them, if you're trying to analyze their origins and so on. But what unites them and what's significant about what draws people to it and their appeal is that there's a common goal. For the socialist, it was the individual has to be subordinated to the group as run by the state. Now, whether it's total control of the economy or partial control of the economy, there's disagreement. But either way, the, the individual is subordinate. So it is a movement. And in some cases, which is now an interesting new phenomenon, Al-Qaeda had this model of getting groups to sign up and, and pledge allegiance to them so that they could show their strength and their power. And this is what Islamic State is replicating. So you get groups that have no geographical proximity at all to Islamic State, signing up as affiliates. And so the, the example that comes to mind is the group in Nigeria that you might have heard about, Boko Haram, which abducted lots of school children, school girls, and does horrible things. It is now regarding itself as an affiliate of the Islamist state. So they, they want themselves, they, in certain moods, they want to show their strength through unity. But for understanding it, what's central is the basic goal politically, religious tyranny. And the, kill, the fact that they kill each other, yes, well, do you remember Stalin? Anyone remember who Stalin? Yeah, Stalin. Do you remember Trotsky? <laughs> who remembers Trotsky? Yeah. Stalin sent assassins to kill Trotsky. Trotsky, <laughs> if you look at the differences between Stalin and Trotsky, they're, they're laughably small. And yet, this is, so it's not an argument against recognizing it as a The only reason you might stress the differences is if you're on this kind of concrete bound perspective that the differences outweigh any significant conceptual pattern or common, common ground. And that's a big problem. People fasten onto the detailed differences and as a result they don't see the larger picture, how it adds up. So I want to turn now to some counterpoints. So things that you will hear or that you have heard or that people bring up, and that there's some way in which people buy into it, and it, they're not obviously crazy. So what is it that makes people buy into it, and what, what, how would you go about untangling them and answering them, and what, if you find it plausible, what do you find plausible about it? So there are two, there are many we could talk about, and there's Q&A, time at the end, and there's also a panel later this week 
on foreign policy. And if I don't get to your questions, that will be another opportunity. So let's talk about the two. The, the two are the Palestinian plight, the plight of the Palestinians, and the other one I'll talk about is called lack of opportunity, which I'll explain in a moment. So the plight of the Palestinians. So John Kerry is sitting, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, is sitting in a room full of diplomats from the Middle East. It's a true story. I wasn't there, but I read about it. True story. <laughs> John Kerry's in a room, and he, they're talking about ISIS. It's obviously a major crisis. And he's, he's looking around the room, and someone raises the point, you know, if this Palestinian-Israeli conflict were settled, there wouldn't be so many people going to ISIS. I mean, it's clearly a recruiting tactic. It's clearly drawing people to this fight. So, you know, go, John Kerry, get back on your plane. Go back to Jerusalem. Get the talks going, you know, the whole thing. And he looks around the room, and that one person has their piece, and he looks around, and there's a whole bunch of people nodding. Now, I don't take a room full of diplomats nodding as a standard of evidence, and I don't think you should. It's not, the, the, the fact that they say it is is not evidence, but it's significant. So why do they think that? Is there evidence that people have for this idea that this conflict or the plight of the Palestinians somehow is an explanation for the movement or some feature of the movement that we've been talking about, the Islamist movement. So I, I did some research on this, and I found studies that I think are credible, and here's what you will find. And some of this you might have heard in other contexts. So one piece of evidence people point to is in bin Laden's documents, where you know, he had declarations of war and statements and so on, he, he mentioned the Palestinians, okay? And then uh, a scholar did an analysis of about 12 years' worth of documents from Al-Qaeda. And he found 158 mentions of Palestine, Palestinians, different versions of the word. Okay? And then he looked at all the propaganda that they were putting out, and he said, well, look, it's, it's everywhere in their propaganda. And then the, the, the final piece of evidence that you can find that I think is, that has purchase in people's minds is this that when, you, when some of the jihadists talk, they mention this, okay? So someone tried to do a study. They, they found some jihadists. I don't exactly know how they interviewed them, but they managed to do it. And they tried to figure out what role did this have in your thinking, in your decision-making. And the, the definitive conclusion was, we don't know. <laughs> we, it's, we can't tell. Because it's not completely missing, but it's not central. It's, you can rule those out, so it's somewhere in the middle, but what, what does that mean? So it, it, it can't explain the whole phenomenon of the Islamist movement, They're not even close, but can explain any part of the phenomenon. Well, you, you can take the argument and sort of recover it and make it intelligible. If you reframe the question, you can say, well, why, to the extent that it works at all as propaganda, and Al-Qaeda thinks it did, and if you look at some of their internal documents, which is what they say when no one's listening, they think it makes, <clears throat> uh, it has an effect, and they think it matters, so why might it have an effect if it has any at all? I think here the answer is not. A whole bunch of people look at the Palestinians and say, I've studied this thoroughly, I know the history, I've under, I understand what's going on, and therefore my loyalty is with the side of the Palestinians. I don't think that's what's going on. That is a big project. I've spent a lot of time trying to do that. It is very hard to figure out what's going on. What is going on is something very different. It is a non-cognitive, it's an emotional response, and an irrational response. And I think it works like this. It works on those whose minds have already been cultivated in the direction of Islamic totalitarianism. And when you raise the word Palestine or Palestinians, it works in the way that a dog whistle works. You know how that's, this idea in politics of a dog whistle is, you could be a room full of people, and I'll say a certain code word, and some of you know what I mean, wink, wink, and the rest of you don't get what I mean. But I've activated a context in your mind. So if I say, if I'm George Bush and I'm speaking to a bunch of evangelicals and I say, I believe in life, everyone else hears that and says, well, what else is there to believe in, right? 
But if you're an evangelical, you think, well, life, that means he's against abortion and he's against euthanasia and he's on my side and he believes in... Okay, so, so that's, the ver- that's the, what the idea of a dog whistle works. There's a certain parallel to the way it works for the jihadists. So when you say Palestine, you activate in their minds an emotional context which works like this. They're Muslims. They're downtrodden. The people who are stepping all over them are infidels, and not only infidels, but the Jewish kind, the worst kind. Jews and crusaders are basically as bad. And on top of it, it's, it's obvious that they're being wronged. The goal of what they're trying to do is raise the banner of Islam over all of Palestine. That has to be right, because we know we should be supreme. Well, of course I'm going to be outraged. Of course it's an injustice. Now that, I suggest to you, is not a rational conclusion. That is, someone's emotional mechanism has been activated. Someone's button has been pressed. And to the extent that you're trying to recruit somebody, what else would you do? You would activate in them a sense of injustice, and it's completely colored and informed by their moral perspective. And their moral perspective is, Islam has to dominate, it's the truth, any deviation from that is heresy or unbelief, which is worse. And in that, that way lies destruction, so we must correct such injustices. Now, justice is a concept in morality, but what you take to be just is always a function of what you take to be the good and the right. So your moral ideas shape what you think justice is. So when they're told, or when they're shown images in Al-Qaeda videos of Palestinians suffering, it is not a reminder that all those 68,000 pages of history that you've read and understand and have a rigorous fact-based view of what the conflict is about, it's not, hey, that's the truth, it's let's all feel bad for them because they're downtrodden and they're our brothers in arms, and we have to go and rectify that. And the idea, and, 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 there's a way in which this is really, really weird because you could be living in Liverpool, England, and, and this have an effect on you, even if you've never set foot in, Pal- in the Palestinian territories, you've never met a Palestinian. And the way that works is that you see yourself, that the identity of being a good Muslim, a devout Muslim, is you are part of a global community. So if you harm, forget that, not a community, a global organism. If you harm one peripheral part of it, you're harming all of us. If you harm my sisters and brothers in Palestine, you're harming me. And this is the way they think. When you read the statement from one of the bombers of the London Underground, do you remember that, 2005, 10 years ago tomorrow, incidentally? One of them, completely British-born, raised, Yorkshire lad, and one of the things he says in explaining their attack is, we're avenging our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, whom, incidentally, we've never met and we'll never meet because we're going to kill ourselves. But the, the idea that there's this kind of global community, it comes from the belief that to be a good Muslim is to be on this path and that there's a solidarity among co-religionists. So the underlying factor, well, if you understand what animates this movement and the way it works on the minds of its followers, this Islamist movement, you see that it shapes their moral thinking perversely, but it shapes it, it colors their decisions, and it actuates their emotional mechanism. It tells them that this is what you have to fight. You have to rectify injustice. It is not rooted, obviously not rooted in fact, and that's a significant point. And there's a lot to say about what's wrong in this mindset of, to, to go back to the Kerry example, even if that were true, there was, you wouldn't, the policy that follows from that is not the policy that he thinks follows from that. But ask me about that in the question period. But the, the important thing to see in this kind of counter explanation is that it, in a way it reaffirms the basic point that I've been arguing, which is that what defines this movement is its uniting goal, its essential goal of bringing religion to the fore and having that shape life and shape your judgment and shape your view of everything that has to happen in the path of the good and the true. I want to turn to one more uh, of these counter-explanations. 
This one is more recent in vintage, though some of you might recognize it. This, so at the, I mentioned earlier there was a summit on combating violent extremism. And in association with that, President Obama gave a speech. And in this speech, which is a fascinating speech, in it he says, I'm not being sarcastic. <laughs> Sometimes I am. I should give a flag when I'm being sarcastic. Um, it's fascinating because what he's arguing is, this is my explanation. I mean, if you boil it down, it's Obama's explanation for what animates the jihadist movement and what draws people to it, which are related issues. And it comes down to this. He thinks there's a cluster of factors. So it's a bunch, it's a many factor problem. Okay, well, a bunch of different factors. And here's what they, what they look like. Well, first of all, you, you, okay, we'll, we'll start with the premise which he has that we're combating violent extremists. So we have to have a bunch of violent extremists on that end of the stage. They're in the wings waiting for this, okay? So that's the first premise. The second premise is there are a whole bunch of people who just want a good life, and they don't have the opportunity to do it. They don't really have a political voice in much of the Middle East, which is true, a lot of tyranny. Uh, economically, you can't really get ahead. I mean, they talk about third world poverty. It's a real problem. They can't build a life. I mean, it's very difficult to start a career and to grow, and a lot of obstacles in your path. And a chief one, now, having said it's a multi-factor problem, it, a big one is the fact that there isn't enough democracy, not enough uh, opportunity to shape the way your life is going to be on a social level, and that creates enormous frustration. Okay, I can believe people are frustrated, now, what happens is a whole bunch of frustrated people over here who just want a good life and can't get it, just wandering around on their way to a job interview, presumably, or maybe not, just going to the job center to pick up the dole, but they're on their way to the job interview, and on the way to the job interview, now I'm being sarcastic, <laughs> on the way to the job interview, a bunch of extremists, and I use scare quotes purposely, they lure them, Obama's word, they lure them into this death cult because, well, if you're frustrated and you want a good life, obviously that means you have to go to ISIS, right? I mean, that's what this, the reductio of this is. <laughs> it doesn't follow that if what you're trying to achieve in the world is really a good life, you want freedom, you want to be able to produce and think and, and, and enjoy yourself, it doesn't follow that you could be lured into a, a, a jihadist nirvana, a caliphate, where they, you know, one of their exports is barbaric snuff videos and human slavery. I mean, I guess there's no other kind, but it's really barbaric sex slavery. It doesn't follow, but it, so the, I emphasize that because there's an unreality here in the way this works. So the whole idea that there's a bunch of crazy people and then they just scoop up well-meaning people who don't have any other options in the world. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The only, if you look at the way that these groups actually recruit, the example I gave you of the Palestinian cause is a, is a good one. The other things they raise are the centrality of faith in life, the centrality of sacrifice for religious ideals. And that to be holy, to be submissive to God, that is the true good life. It's a very different conception of the good life. I don't think you can go... So if you ask me when I, in my 20s, so I want a career, I want to do things interesting and, and achieve things in my life, isn't it obvious you should go and join the jihadists? And what are you talking about? <laughs> it's the most obviously wrong thing to do. Not if you really care about your life and you want freedom. And of course, I mean, there's a lot of evasion going on in this Obama explanation. So it draw, one of the things that it does, and this is important in untangling it, is it completely drops out the ideological character of the jihadist movement. It makes it seem like it's just some sort of psychological cult. Now, in, in psychology is important to understanding this phenomenon. And the way they manipulate people and the way they control, that's important. It's not 
the fundamental in explaining what animates people, what makes them cross oceans and fly across the world to join this movement, nor does it explain why, and this is an important point, you find people who have good opportunities, who have education, who have, who, whose ability to get a job and succeed in the West is unparalleled. They're going to ISIS. So all the factors that Obama claims are necessary in explaining this, they could be missing and you can still find people who join ISIS. A quarter, roughly a quarter by one estimate of all the people who've traveled to join ISIS are from the United Kingdom, North America, Western Europe, and in Western Europe, I mean places like Switzerland. Even Sweden <laughs> has people who go there. Which, uh, <laughs> Sweden would be the epitome of what Obama's world would look like if he had his way, I think, in some ways. So you have this phenomenon, and so you remember there was a, a video that ISIS put out, and one of the killers in this video had a British accent, and it was, who is this guy? And there's a lot of questioning and so on, and it turns out it's this guy from England who had a computer science degree, which opens a lot of doors, and this is the path he took. Now, that is a data point. It is not a conclusive refutation, but it's a certainly important data point for overturning this idea that the lack of opportunity and frustration and political oppression, this whole terror, terror and tyranny connection, the idea that if you live under tyranny, you will become a terrorist, it doesn't hold water, and this is just further evidence of it. And it, you have to see how it fits in the larger framework of what this movement is about, its basic ideological goal. So fortunately, in, in certain ways, there was a lot of pushback to Obama's speech. And I don't know if you guys remember this. Um, this is our, the, one of the State Department spokeswomen, uh, Marie Harf. And on Twitter, as these things happened, there was a whole flurry of ridicule of her view because and, you know, she amplified the president's message saying, well, you can't fight the way out of ISIS. What you need is you know, bring them jobs and education and, and, and opportunity. So basically, all the talking points. So she's, she's taking the flack for Obama's speech, basically. And she doubled down on this. People, you know, she went on TV and insisted, you're not getting the nuance of this. <laughs> I, I'm all for nuance, but then there are times when this isn't nuanced at all. And there was a, you know, naturally, there's a hashtag, jobs for terrorists. Clearly, that's the solution, right? And I have to say, I thought that was refreshing, and I was, I don't have anything against her, but she's presenting a view that's wrong, and it needs to be ridiculed and called out. But there's a sting to this story, which is as much as people ridicule this, and it's a good thing to the extent that they had the right reasons, to the extent that this was ridiculed, there was a missing identification, there was a missing fact. Because if it's true that this view that Obama is putting forward is wrong-headed, that it's missing the basic motivation of the movement, that it doesn't get, in essence, what the Islamist movement is about, if that's all true, and if, we, if we're going to laugh about the idea that the way to solve terrorism is by giving them jobs, then this has to be true. This is President George W. Bush. Twitter didn't exist back then, but if it did, he deserved the same kind of ridicule. Because it was the centerpiece of George Bush's policy to advance what in effect was a social welfare policy in the Middle East. This was the democracy crusade. And point for point, he advocated what Obama is advocating in terms of an explanation for the problem. Tyranny, lack of education, lack of mobility economically, Frustration. Now, an important difference, which we, we mustn't gloss over, is that obviously Ob Obama is not calling for going to the Middle East and, and using military force to implement these social welfare kind of solutions, and, and Bush did. But they agree on the basic understanding or misunderstanding of what the problem is. And there's a lot wrong with this analysis, but the essential I want to stress is that you, you when you drop out the basic ideological character of the movement, this is the kind of non-thinking that you end up with. And that people find plausible. You, there are studies that, that are 
conducted by reputable people who try to find correlations between tyrannical regimes and the production of terrorism. And you can find some of these, and there's certain logics to why this happens. But it is not an explanation for the Islamist movement's rise, popularity, or growth, or continuing moral more strength of morale. There are not explanations for that. So I've talked about what this movement is. I've given you some examples of ways in which people have explanations that don't really add up, and some of what's wrong with those counter-explanations, which I hope you, you find clarifying. There's another view that I don't have time to go into, and I don't think it's import, super important to talk about. I'll mention it, and if people want to ask me, there's a question time. And it's the idea that you heard right after 9-11, and there's still people on the fringes who think this is true, is that the cardinal explanation that what gets these people to fight us is American foreign policy arrogance. We throw our weight around, and that gets, them, that gets their back up. I don't think that's a coherent explanation. I don't think it's factually true if you look at the history and there are cases that people like to cite about where America meddled in the Middle East. And we've done some stupid things and we, our policy is irrational in many ways. Even given all of that, I don't think it's a sufficient explanation, not even close. And the way this works on some people is, look, they're complaining about our support for these bad leaders, these dictators, these uh, tyrants. And it's true, American policy has done things like that. It's definitely backed Mubarak and other dictators. But notice this. This is not coming from people who want to replace one tyrant with freedom. This is people who are saying, we don't like the tyrant's form of tyranny. We want our own kind of tyranny. Now, that's an important point if, if you hear people talk about this, is to recognize that the critique has no moral standing if it's coming from people who are vying to gain power and replace one dictator with another. It's not to excuse or, or, or push aside American irrational policy, which we can talk about, but I don't think the idea of our supposed arrogance is what gets them, or our throwing our weight around is what gets them to come after us. I don't think that is even close to true. And fundamentally, it misreads what American foreign policy actually looks like. Because when you look at what the pattern is, I mean, it, it's a chaos. Let's, let's just stipulate the beginning. American foreign policy in the Middle East is basically you, you throw a bunch of stuff in a bag and you shake it, and then you put it in a blender and you zap it, and then you take it out, and then you have a mess. And that's what it looks like. It's, it's a god-awful mess. To find coherence in it, if you found a pattern, I think it would be this, is that we have been insufficiently assertive. We have not defined our own interests, and we have not recognized threats when they have arisen. So the run-up to 9-11, I think, is one of those. When they do arise, our response to them, as powerful as we are militarily, our response to them has been what? You guys have nothing to do with Islam. You're, you're just hijackers. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to go over there and bring elections. As opposed to, you've killed Americans, we're going to defeat you. That is what it look, should look like. It looked nothing like that. And if you want to understand another important factor, a factor that we control as Americans, <clears throat> that has an influence on the motivation of the jihadists, not on their character or their goals, but on their, on their energy, on what gives them fuel. You need to look at what we've done since 9-11 and, and recognize, and this is a big part of what I argue in my book, is that we haven't really been pursuing our interests in the Middle East. We haven't been forceful enough and when we act in that way, and we've done that for many years, even prior to 9-11, what we've done in that way is we confirm the basic narrative of the jihadists in this specific way. So if the logic of their position, using logic generously, if the, the 
argument that they put forward is, we have to be supreme. Anything that stands in the way of that has to be destroyed. And ultimately, we need total domination. Then, if that's what they're trying to do, any, and so this means being pious. So to, to walk in the path of Allah means we're going to realize Sharia law as far and as wide as we can. If that's what it means, then any evidence that a secular society, an unbelieving society, is weak, that is motivating because it's, it's, that's true. We're strong because Allah is, has our back, and they're weak because they don't have Allah. Okay? Now, that might sound really fanciful. And yet, the way, there are important ways in which Islamist leaders have invoked American foreign policy as a way to rally people and recruit them. And what they point to is not look at America throwing its weight around. What they point to are incidents when America was weak and seemingly weak and bowed to them. I'll give you three quick examples. The revolution in Iran in 1979 was really thrilling to the jihadist movement. It was a turning point. And one reason for that is the Shah of Iran was a close ally of the United States. It's not to say he was a good guy, but this is just a fact of history. That the Islamists were able to succeed against someone who was associated with America was evidence to them that their piety gave them outsized strength. Look at this. We managed to kick out a Shah who was an American proxy. So that means we're stronger than them. But even more encouraging was the, what came afterwards, the hostage taking of American diplomats in the embassy in Tehran. And it was the way that unraveled. Not only did we not go after them when we should have early on in terms of releasing our diplomats, when you get into the details of how we resolved this, not only did we bow to them and allow them to ridicule and humiliate America, we actually paid them for the privilege. Now, the fact that money changed hands is not the decisive point, but it only adds emphasis. And the way Khomeini, Ayatollah Khomeini, would relish this fact, he would tell people, is, he would say, America can't do a damn thing. Look, look what we did. And this is their response. Number three, you might remember in the 1980s, American troops were sent into the Lebanese Civil War as peacekeepers. There's a lot wrong with why they were sent and how they were sent and the way they were told to conduct themselves. But here's what happened that really gets bin Laden excited and his followers. A suicide bomber who was working in league with Iran blew himself up with a truck. And this brought down the barracks where American Marines were, were sleeping, and they were, they were killed, 241 of them. And the reaction to this was from Reagan. You know, we, we'll never let this happen. We can't allow people to go after our, our troops. Damn right. A few weeks later, all of the Americans are shipped out over onto a boat, and then they're sent back home. So basically, the way bin Laden tells the story is, one of our holy warriors came along, he did his thing, and you guys, you guys were cowards. You carried your dead and wounded. Of course you're cowards, you're weak. You're a paper tiger. Now, one incident does not make uh, uh, it does not warrant that conclusion. But unfortunately, we have made that conclusion seem more and more plausible over time. In the last 10 years plus, since 9-11, what has done more to encourage them than, they, than you can imagine is the fact that 
our policies have made it possible for Islamists to gain greater power, not merely as kind of mistakes and accidents, but as by the logic of the position. What, is it, what else does it mean when we, f we send our troops into Iraq and we allow elections, all, we, we encourage elections all over the place and groups like Hamas win elections and Islamists in Iraq win the elections. We're pushing open the door for them to gain greater power. And even the ones who felt that joining the elections would be sacrilegious, because there's definitely groups that thought this is a mistake, we mustn't allow ourselves to get into this, this is unbelief. Even they can recognize the truth that we are making it possible for them to go stronger, to gain power that they would not otherwise have. That is incredibly motivating. And we've demonstrated at the same time that we're doing this that we're not serious about going after and defeating them. So if there is something that act activates them and encourages them, it's the side of Western appeasement and weakness over decades. So what I've hoped to show you and to impress upon you is that when you understand the essential goal that this movement is seeking, it clarifies a lot of things. It explains how they operate, why they do what they do, why they carry out the kinds of attacks that they do, and how they attract people, and what makes those people believe that their actions are necessary. This is a movement that is shaped and animated by a religious goal of subjugation, and that implies conquest, and that implies boundless conquest. So with that chilling thought, I will draw a line, and I'll take some questions if you have them. Thank you. So if there is no fundamental widespread change, um, what dangers lie ahead for the West? Um, should we expect more localized attacks, Islamic invasion, Iranian development and use of nuclear weapons? Um, what's the future? Um, I, I hesitate to give specific scenarios because I don't, I don't know what they're thinking. I, I think the essential answer is they're motivated, they think they can get away with a lot, and recent events such as the attacks in Paris and Copenhagen, they're not getting the kind of resistance that would make them rethink their cause. And uh, so that's sort of the, the basic answer. In terms of breaking this into specific countries or movements that will threaten us, I think as bad as ISIS is, and it, it's horrendous, I hesitate to, to evaluate them comparatively because it, they're all terrible. I think a really significant problem is the Iranian regime. And even if they don't get nuclear weapons, they're a problem. Because look at what they're doing today. They don't, they don't have nuclear capabilities as far as we know. And they're getting, they've been operating with impunity for decades and growing more and more aggressive. They were all over the Iraqi insurgency. They are now in the Afghanistan, believe it. They're helping the Taliban. They are trying to dominate that region. I think the, the more they can act without opposition, the more confident they will become. And the kind of, so when you're dealing with this kind of irrationality, it's hard to say what they won't do. I mean, when, when, they, when Iran cultivates among its own people the belief that martyrdom is a good thing, well, what else is there? I mean, what, I mean, I'm sure there's more crazy, barbaric things people can imagine, but that's sort of the limit in my view. So it, it's difficult to say what form it will take. Um, it's important, I, I would make one final point, which is it's important to see that the movement itself materially, as strong as it, I've described it at the beginning, it is nowhere near as strong as 
any Western country or even the United States. And that's significant. So militarily, it is not significant in the sense of, I don't think an invasion is something that can happen. I think that's not realistic. But that is not what we have to fear. <laughs> Because it will persist so long as people believe that the basic cause, the basic goal that they're fighting for is worth pursuing. And this could go on for a long time, given the patterns we've seen domestically in terms of our failure to oppose it. Uh, so it, my worry is that it, there could be a big new change with Iran at some point soon when, when I think it becomes a nuclear capable regime. And that will change the dynamics in the region. But it, it's just that it's important to see that this movement is driven by a cause, and that, there's no telling how long that will go. Hey, um, let's see. Um, so I've been studying Marxism recently, and um, one really interesting theme that I noticed in it is this idea that man's, the, the fundamental determining characteristic in man's life is his economic condition, that Whatever economic condition he's born into, that's what determines his lifestyle, his ideology, even the sports he's played, in some cases I've read. Do you think that this, um, this idea that jihadism is caused by the economic condition that these people are born into, does that have any tie to Marxism? Maybe it's not just some arbitrary thing, absurdity that they throw out there, but is really based on a a tradition of analyzing things through this Marxist lens. Do you think there's a are connection you, there? I, just to clarify, so are you yeah. speaking of the people in the West who explained yeah. it this, or like the Obama types and the people behind him? Well, what's scary is Bush apparently explained it that way too, but that seems to have a very Marxist mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I, I think there is, origin. Th th so I think there are ways in which Marxist or Marxian thought colors this, and, and it's not the only factor, but Here's what I've observed. The pushing aside of the role of religion or the role of ideas in shaping people's lives. Marx, obviously, that's a big part of the, the Marxist agenda, which is your ideas are shaped by your economic conditions. So ideas are really just the rationalizations for the facts that we see. And, that, and so what happens in the academy, in anthropology and sociology and other fields, that this idea becomes second nature, and, and the, the fact that someone could truly believe in a religion, take it seriously enough to act on it, and that that is an explanation for what they're doing, that's hard to process, because if you've been trained, and you, a lot of the theory that you've read is, well, people are the products of their environment and their economic factors, that, that's a big step. And so there's a research in the 50s around what is this, this Muslim Brotherhood thing? <laughs> and one of the scholars in the field was saying, I know we are uncomfortable with this. I know everything you've heard tells you that it's something other than religion. But what I'm really telling you after field work and talking to these people is, no, no, no it really is their religion, their ideas shaping it. So I think that there is that in, the, in some academic disciplines and just in the tradition of where, how they think about it. And I think it's wider in the culture, too, is that people don't, there's a way in which they don't see how ideas really shape. And it's a hard thing to conceptualize. It's not like it's an obvious thing and they're, they're being uh, dense. I don't think that's true. And, it, and it's compounded by if they've gone to college, they hear uh, different perspectives. There's also, which I think is related, a... So there's, there's other streams in kind of philosophy that shape this, but. I'll leave those to one side. I think just in the culture that we live in, there's such an emphasis on the concrete. And if you look at the region, it really is poor. And people who are, are drawn to this movement, some of them are poor. And there's this latching onto a concrete, and, and what Ayn Rand called concrete boundedness, this perceptual level perspective. That, for people, is a sufficient explanation. That there could be something more abstract. Well, we don't need to know anything more than that. That's, that's just challenging, and who, who cares about that? Um, now, and it's funny because when you look at the leaders of the movement, they're not poor. I mean, one of the things that you learn quickly about Osama bin Laden is he comes from a wealthy family. And a lot of the operatives in some of the big attacks were themselves well-educated, 
basically middle-class people, engineers, some of them. So there's a way in which there's a conflation of, well, there's a lot of poor people and they find this plausible, which is true, with, well, that must mean everyone in the movement is poor and that's the cause of what's happening. That's not true. The, any movement has people at different roles and different functions. There's the ideologues and the, uh, the lieutenants and the operative type people. So there's a way in which not thinking about it leads you to easy, facile kind of conclusions, which is it's obviously economics. We can observe it, we can measure it, and you can get UN studies on the scale of how uh, deprived people are. So I think those are some of the factors behind it. I, so in other words, I think there's some Marxist influences in terms of pushing ideas out of consideration than uh, other kind of factors do. Hi, um, the last gentleman took the basic thrust of my question uh, on Marxism, but I, I want to amplify that by asking a, a wider question. Uh, and that is, uh, to what extent do you believe that the, the rise of this, uh, this form of revolutionary uh, jihad is a result of um, the, uh, the, the post-Kantian world and, uh, and the abdication of Western thought leaders of, um, of the Enlightenment tradition? How did that open up a, a space for this sort of phenomenon to happen? Because we know that, uh, um, that uh, Khomeini studied uh, in Paris um, and, uh, and studied Rousseau. Uh, so uh, to what extent do you think that, uh, that gives rise to this kind of phenomenon? That's a very complex question. I'll, I'll take one aspect of it. There's a lot to say, and some of it I actually know, some of it I'm speculating, but what I know is, is this. The, the core of this movement ideologically is rooted in Islam. There's no, uh, there's no question about that. The, the, some of the tactical, strategic kind of thinking that you see in their writings, including Khomeini and Kut, some of it is influenced by the, at the time, trendy thinking that you see about revolutionaries, about throwing off, neo, uh, throwing off colonial powers, and also communist thinking, uh, specifically. So if you read one of Kut's books, which is, is one of the more accessible books, it has undertones of social justice. He uses that term. I mean, that's the translator's term. But I think he meant to, advocate, to evoke that concept. And this idea, and Khomeini has this too, Khomeini allied with the leftists in the revolution as a, as a kind of alliance of convenience. And he co-opted a lot of their language of helping the downtrodden and the weak and the proletariat, and he, he repackaged it in Islamic terms, and he made it seem like these, are, these all fit together. In a certain way, they do, because morally they're on the same axis of submission of the individual to some other authority and, and, and dominating people. So th there's ways in which their thinking has been influenced by those uh, ideas, I, and including totalitarian thinking, so th they can find lots of examples in history to model themselves on in terms of how to shape a society, indoctrinate people. And I think they do borrow from that. I, I think it's important, though, to, to recognize that those are accretions. They're, they're things they are borrowing. I don't think they're essential to the core message of what they're trying to do. So these are tips we learned along the way, or things we think are going to sell well today, given what people believe. And evidence for that conclusion is that they've, they, they dropped that. <laughs> There's ways in which they, they're much more on the premise of, never mind this idea that we're for social justice the way that Kut was talking about. Let's drop that slogan. Let's just focus more on what we're, sort of the Islamist character of what we're doing and the, the, our uncompromising position in that, on that goal. And, and you see this happen across time. And Khomeini, once he got into power, he, he executed many of the leftists and, and purged them. So that was, it was a, a matter of gaining power through, well, if this is going to work for you, if the shoe fits, come along. That will be great. Um, and so the reason I'm stressing these as my understanding is that their influences in terms of how to think about revolution and, and tactics and strategy, there's a danger of making them sound like they're just like 
communists who adopt Islam. So this idea that Islamo-fascism is just an... I think that, that, that obscures what they're really trying to do. And it's not... It both obscures what they're trying to do, and it's not what they tell us, which is really significant. I think listening to what they say, it seems obvious, but there's not enough of that. So I hope that's helpful. Elon, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but in your opinion, what do you think has made the so-called leaders of our country so weak, and I guess I wanted to say stupid, but maybe I'll say superficial, because given everything you've said, and I, I agree with it, it's very, very hard to understand how people can, in the name of religion, kill babies. It's, it's, it's beyond logic to me, but I believe that it is a religious fanaticism of some kind. How can we be, how can we have grown so weak over time? What is happening to cause this spiraling down? So again, that, that's a really, it's a terrific question because it, it's worthy of a book and I actually wrote a book about that. Um, <laughs> I've, I have to plug this because I don't think enough people have read it. Um, I, I don't mean to make light of your question. Is that you're winning the unwinnable world yes, book? I'm going I, to get it. It should be up on the screen. The, the reason I say it's a complex question is there's a lot of things happening, but I'll, I'll give you just a brief answer. It's obviously my book, and I'm happy to talk about it separately uh, private, uh, after the talk. You, you characterize it as stupid and, and weak, and I, I don't think, I, I agree, I don't think stupid is quite right, but I think weak and... Um, unthinking or, or cognitively impaired in some specific way. I think those do go together and I think a prime factor is the moral ideas that shape policy. And those are the dominant ideas in our culture. The idea of sacrifice as a good and the idea that, a consequent idea that who are you to assert yourself in your own defense, in, your, in pursuing your own goals? And people find this difficult, and it is difficult to process, but the evidence is all over uh, the Bush administration, even Obama. And so that idea of sacrifice, that we must help the needy, regardless of why they're needy, that we must serve selflessly, sacrificially, that, so that kind of colors the weakness. We, we don't feel like we have a right to act or that what we believe we can do is much more constrained than what it really is. So there's, there's definitely certain things we've done. Like going into Iraq is an act of assertion, but it's not nearly what it needs to look like, and it's not the right target, and all kinds of things. But there's a way in which it affects thinking, too. So when your thinking is colored by this moral idea, there's certain questions you don't ask, and you, you know you shouldn't ask. Um, it, it narrows your range of thinking so that, well, what are these people trying to do? Well, they, they couldn't possibly be related to religion. That's impossible, because well, we think religion is a good thing. And why would, we, why would we insult them and why would we make them feel bad? There are already a lot of Muslims in the world who got a lot of reasons to feel bad. That would just be unseemly, and why do that? And worse, it, it comes out, I mean, this, I'll give you an example uh, of how this both of these play together. So the idea of our weakness and then and sacrifice as an ideal and the way that colors our thinking. I think that the Bush doctrine as applied to the Palestinian elections, which you might remember happened about 10 years ago, I think that is a, an, a, a pivotal moment in American foreign policy in the region. And here's why. Bush, as a matter of doctrine, thought you need to bring elections, people who, everyone wants freedom that's buried in the heart of every man by God. Okay, every piece of evidence you could find from people on the Democratic side, people on the Republican, every piece of evidence was saying, look, it's the Hamas who's going to win. And people inside the administration were saying, what are you thinking? <laughs> what are you thinking? And people in Israel saying, you, you, it just doesn't make sense. You can't have people who are carrying guns run the country and join elections. Now, every data you could find would tell you, this is the direction, this is the most likely path this is going to take. The explicit policy of the administration was, 
We believe in elections. Who are we to tell them what outcome needs to happen? Who are we to tell them what limits to put on who can run? Because one of the things was a, a really big sticking point is, well, why let them run, let Hamas run in the first place? They haven't given up violence. And, you know. Sensible people agree that you shouldn't be a violent group running. For, we should let the Palestinians sort this out. Who are we to impose our standards? Okay. So Hamas, and we don't, we won't believe that the Palestinians could possibly embrace Hamas. So this is, because they're downtrodden, they couldn't possibly be bad. Even though poll after poll tells you this is the path the culture is taking. So obviously Hamas wins the election by a landslide. And Condoleezza Rice says, I don't know anyone who saw this coming. You know, I, I've talked to everyone at the State Department and we were all dumbfounded. No kidding, because you weren't looking. <laughs> you, you would not accept the possibility that people who are weak and, uh, like, if you observe them, they're weak and suffering and they're miserable and they live under their own kind of tyranny. All of that's true perceptually. But they won't go to, well, what values do they have? What, what responsibility do they have for their own condition, if any? What have they done to improve it? What do they actually believe? You don't ask questions like that of those who are needy. You just serve them. So you bring them elections. And, when they, and then when Hamas wins, what do you do? Do you hold them responsible for choosing Hamas? I've changed my mind. Yeah. We are stupid. <laughs> you can call it stupidity, but it's a self-created, unthinking blind spot. that so You will not judge those who you think are weak and in need of being served. So uh, that's a long example, but uh, it's all over what we do, and I think that's emblematic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I always thought the turning point for Islam was Al Ghazali in 1000 BC, who rejected the Greeks and Aristotle, and that's dominated. But my question is a different one. If you look at the total pattern of actions of the Islamist over the years, which is basically killing, blowing themselves up and everyone else, including each other, and with their philosophy worshiping uh, martyrdom, that at the deepest root, whether they would admit this or not, it's a philosophy of death worship. It worships death, especially because they say life on earth isn't really that important anyway. And with death worshippers, of course, what can you do besides kill them? So, so I think there's definitely truth in the idea that death has a higher value than life, to put it that way. And you see this, so when I was describing the critique that Kut made of the contemporary world that he lived in, one of the things he says is, is you're all too much concerned with your material well-being. You're too concerned with this world. Now, we know Muslims should be dominant, but that's not the whole story. The, the bigger story is, are you in the right relationship with Allah? Are you going to, what is your other life going to look like? And that's an important part of the story. The idea that, that they worship death, I hesitate to uh, take that as kind of a uniform uh, premise because it's true that they don't value life. But I don't know that you can... So the idea of martyrdom is a big part of their doctrine. But there's also a way in which, at a certain point, if they can't get the kind of propaganda value out of these attacks, if they can't get enough of the targets to carry out, they'll try something else. So the idea that they're perpetually going to have suicide bombers as their preferred tactic, I don't think that's true. I think it's a tactic that fits their ideology. It fits their priorities and their goals, and, and it, there's no objection to it in that sense. But there's other things they could do, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>